Okay, click. All right, well, thanks for uh, joining us today and hi from Seattle. I'm sorry, I can't uh, be there. It, it looks like we have a pretty manageable size group. So I'm gonna stop at various places and ask for folks to um, say what they're what they're thinking. So <clears throat> I want to talk today about um, this idea of solution focused uh, trans diagnostic approaches to mental health and especially in pediatric primary care. And I guess if there is really one um, big, really big takeaway from this from this whole thing is that by really trying to sort of listen to people to understand uh, what it is that concerns them, that to some extent, we can kind of leap over having to make a diagnosis and use a lot of things from our primary care toolkit to try to help people uh, in ways that are likely to be effective and likely to be um, safe. Uh, and and pretty efficient uh, to deliver in a primary care setting. So I just I just want to <clears throat> acknowledge that um, I didn't think of a whole lot of this stuff myself. That uh, this material is really the fruit of uh, many years of collaboration with all sorts of uh, different people who um, I'm really grateful to have worked with. And I don't have any disclosures. There are no conflicts of interest, and we're not going to talk about any off-label prescribing and that uh, funding for this uh, project has, this work over the years has come from a, a number of different um, public sources. So what we're gonna cover is this idea of what's a trans diagnostic intervention, um, thought processes while people are stressed or sad or anxious, just something to be mindful about when we're talking to folks, uh, setting the tone for a visit and getting an agenda out on the table. And then in the second session, we'll get to the idea of how we frame actionable problems for people and, and get to a solution-focused approach that they can take away from the visit. So thinking about this term transdiagnostic, which sounds fancy, is that in general, we're, we're taught in medicine and nursing that we're supposed to match a treatment to a condition. You know, you figure out what the infection is, uh, what the actual organism is, and then you match the treatment. Um, but sometimes we have treatments that work for a wide variety of conditions, sort of thinking, let's say, about antibiotics when you treat empirically, um, although we're not going to worry about developing drug resistance here. Um, and we can skip over some diagnostic steps because in a, in a way it doesn't matter uh, at least initially, exactly what the nature of the of the problem is. We we have something which is safe and likely to be effective, so we're going to try it. So in mental health, we have a lot of tools like that. I mean, one in especially in kids, we can take advantage of the fact that most emo emotional and behavioral conditions occur at the same time. So kids who are anxious are often often depressed. Kids who have behavioral problems. Um, are often anxious or they can be depressed. Uh, and so the need to pick these apart is, is less important because fortunately, a lot of the treatments for those things are highly overlapping or are the same. And, and we call that principle common elements. So just as an example, if you have a, a child who's very anxious about schoolwork um, has trouble sitting down and focusing, and you really can't tell whether this is anxiety, is this uh, a learning disability of, of some sort, uh, is this ADHD? Well, the intervention of sitting down, having the parent be able to sit down with somebody, work on the, um, you know, here's the homework, how are we going to divide this up into manageable chunks, how are we going to think about it, when will we take breaks, that, that treatment um, addresses some of the learning issues. It could potentially be a good treatment for uh, the attention deficit problems, and it's a great treatment for anxiety. And so we don't necessarily always have to make a diagnosis. What we can do is we can say, okay, we've got something that should target all of this, and we're going to try to use it. So 
in, in that way, we're, we're treating presumptively. We're assuming that there could be a range of underlying conditions, but we've got something that actually ought to target them all. And if it doesn't work, we can always do more diagnostic work. So that's also what people call a SEPT care approach. So that's our introduction to being transdiagnostic. The next thing I want to shift to is, is just a reminder, because I think all of us, when we sit down for a second, realize that that this applies to us as well, is that when, when, when we're stressed, our brains don't work the same way as they do when we're relaxed. So we've got a bunch of brain circuits that help us respond to perceived threats or to stressful situations. And they're mood dependent. That is the way they work together changes depending upon what our mood is. Um, in general, what they're supposed to do is strike the right balance for attention to threats versus um, how we be safe and whether something is going to reward us or whether it's going to be negative, it's going to punish us. Um, and, and as we said, stress changes the, the balance of these things. And bringing a child to a healthcare uh, clinician with a mood or developmental or behavior problem is stressful and it changes the way the parents that we interact with are gonna behave. So what are some of the things that, that happen? So when people are stressed, the processing circuits that help us learn about potentially dangerous things and assess them change. And what and the big one, I'm going to put highlight these in red, is that we tend to use less information before making a judgment that something represents threat or anger. In other words, the first little indication that something might be negative sets us off. And in addition to that, we respond more strongly to negative compared to positive cues, and we latch on to the negative ones faster and take longer to drop our attention to them. So <clears throat> this can happen even if we've tried really hard over time to change the way we respond to things. You know, we've we've worked really hard on trying to be more patient. We've worked really hard on trying to be sort of braver, but suddenly in a moment of stress, something that sets us off or that, that makes us feel threatened, you know, now we've just gone back to the to the same old thing. The other thing or another thing that happens is changes is in this process called context processing. And this is the idea that we don't sit and look around where we are to see whether this particular cue that we're evaluating as being threatening is in fact not threatening because it's happening in a different place. Um, so we don't look around either in our own you know, thoughts or just even to sort of realize what's going on around us to try to understand <clears throat> whether this is a threatening context or not. And we'll we'll talk about <clears throat> a concrete example of this a little bit later, but the one that people always like to to think about is, you know, you see um, a fearful animal um, in the wild. Let's say if you're here and I'm looking out the window and seeing the cascades where uh, there was recently a cougar attack in, in a suburban neighborhood. And, um, you know, if, if I saw a cougar while I was, you know, hiking up a, you know, trail in an urban park, I would be quite frightened. Um, if I saw that same cougar behind the bars of the Woodland Park Zoo, which is a, a few miles in the other direction here, um, I wouldn't be frightened of it at all because those bars are there. But sometimes we can be triggered by mental cougars and, and forget that they're, you know, in a cage and that we um, don't really need to be afraid of them there. The other thing that happens when we're stressed is that our ability to regulate our emotion uh, really greatly diminishes. And there, there are two big, you know, pieces, you know, here that I want to highlight. One is that it seems to take more mental energy to try to think about what's going on. Um, it, we're we're stressed out, and we don't want to, um, you know, try to figure out how to fix it. I mean, uh, one example of this could be that, let's say you're 
driving around somewhere in the car and you find yourself lost. If you're in a relaxed mood, you might pull over to the side of the road, get out your phone, um, look up, you know, whatever your favorite map application is. And the fact that you have to figure out where to pull over, um, fiddle with the phone, try to get that app to work, get out your glasses if you're like me and you can't see the little markings on the map, that all, that's fine. But if you're in a stressed sort of a situation, then just the very thought of having to find a place to pull over, having to fiddle with your phone, you know, the couple of steps that it takes suddenly seems insurmountable. Um, so people don't respond very poorly in situations of stress to being asked to think about things that require, you know, even minor degrees of complexity. And we also find ourselves when we're stressed, having difficulty shifting our thoughts away from the stressful thing. This is this sort of deer in the headlights idea that we we can't get that troubling thought out of our mind. It, it's just the only thing that, that we can concentrate on. And perhaps you know the most important thing that happens when we're stressed is that we lose the ability to, th or relatively speaking, to think about what's going to be happening that could be good, that could come out of a situation. And we have a very diminished expectation that good things could happen to us at all. Well, all we're doing is we're just really focused on trying to avoid the bad stuff. So <clears throat> let's think about you know, a family that that comes to see us uh, in, let's say, a, a primary care setting, and they have a child who they've been having trouble with. Maybe they've gotten a call from school that says, you know, I'm, um, you've got to take this child to the doctor because, you know, they're misbehaving and, you know, they need to medicate them or they need to um, evaluate them for ADHD. Uh, and it's been, um, somebody had to take off some time from school. It was hard to, and from work, it was hard to get to the office. Uh, the weather was bad. They thought they were on time, but then they had to shovel the snow or scrape the windshield. Um, so they, they get to, to you and they are, um, irritable. Uh, they can't, really tell you exactly why they're there. Um, you know, what what could be going on? Well, you know, one possibility is that they they really, rather than just being nasty people, that they're depressed or they're sad. Um, they're at the end of their rope because they've been trying a bunch of things and they just feel nothing's working. Um, they're late for this appointment and they've already, they're anticipating that you're going to be or someone's going to be irritable with them. Um, they don't actually understand, you know, what what the whole healthcare system is about. They're not really sure that you can help them. They may have had prior bad experiences. So the, the first thing that we want to try to do to be therapeutic in this transdiagnostic way is to try to help people, to, first of all, to realize that people are coming in, in this sort of a state and that their thinking is not the way uh, we would like it to be and that not the way they'd like it to be. So we've got to try to get them back into a place where they can think more appropriately and, and more effectively. And, and this is the, um, the, the snake thing. Again, I, I was talking about cougar. This is the snake. And, and the question is, how do we convince people that our office, you know, if you will, is, is the zoo and not the, the wild? Um, so people are coming in and they're going to have cues that suggest that this is a stressful place. I'm going to have to talk about something uncomfortable. People may or may not be happy with me because I got there on time or I didn't get there on time. Um, but I've got to somehow or other help people realize that all of these things, which could be threats in other places are not threatening. Here in this office, you're safe. 
we recognize that um, these things are difficult and that's what we're here for. We're here to help you with the difficult things, not to blame you for them. So <clears throat> this, this is the, the start is how do we just even say hi to people? Um, how do we let them know what it is that it's okay for them to talk about? How do we um, give them a, a chance to sort of get oriented to what's gonna happen? Um, and we can't assume that they know these things either because they've never been there before or because things have already changed in their lives since the last time that they came. So this is a, a great place for me to, to stop um, and just ask you, what, how do you like to sort of greet people when they first walk into your, into your office? How do you let them know that the context that they're going to be um, seeing you in is not one of these stressful contexts, but in fact, it's a, it's a supportive one. Anybody have any advice that they would give to a um, someone earlier in their career or a trainee um, about how to just do the just those even first you know few minutes of a visit and and please feel free to unmute um I, mandy says i i like to say that we're we're glad you're here but if, if you feel like unmuting and talking please do I think it's the context as well as to like where you're working at and how much time you get to have with them. Mm -hmm. uh, time frames as far as greeting them, a handshake, offering them if they get to sit with you for a while. If you're in a clinic setting, you're doing a therapy, um, then maybe can I get you anything to drink? Offer them something. Um, but I know that's not the time frame that you get to have in the in the pediatric clinic world as far as medical clinic side. Well, I think one of the, I'm, I'm glad Jen, you brought up the, the issue of time here because time, we have a very different sense of time as uh, both as clinicians, but also um, stress, our stress changes our sense of time. And and one of the big things that that happens at the beginning of, of visits is that um, we we have the sense that we've got so much that we've got to do that, that everything that isn't directly sort of addressing that seems like, you know, we, we can't afford to do very much of it. The pitch that I would make as part of this is that getting people into this state where they um, feel comfortable speaking with you, where they feel receptive to new ideas, that, that, that that's really time that's super well invested and that taking an extra couple of minutes to do that at the beginning is, is a is is well worth it in terms of um what's potentially gonna you know happen in let's say in the next 15 minutes if assuming that that's all you've got so um so so some people like to say i'm glad you're here what else what are what other things <laughs> yes so so kennedy said um, I think it starts at check-in. How can our receptionist greet and help patients, family coming in, taking extra time to smile, listen, explain, and check in? You, that is so so true. This is this is clearly a team sport, and the the fact that the people at the front desk, um, who who are sometimes the most therapeutic people in the whole practice, um, because they their their job really is to help people transition from that crazy outside world um where you're just struggling just to show up to now being in a place th that things are going to be helpful so so yes helping if if you've got a front desk that can do those sorts of things you have a huge 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 leg up any any other who does anybody um, in your in your practices or where you work? Are there are there folks in between the front desk and when they see you? Are there medical assistants or or nurses or? And I don't know everybody's role here, so I apologize if I'm getting the question wrong.
I would guess from um, the clinic settings, the receptionist, and then the nurse, somebody to mm -hmm. check you in with the weights, vitals, mm -hmm. and then rooming. Mm -hmm. So, so one thing that is that is really great is if if those if some of those people uh, know enough about your office routines or or can can help uh, you know start with the orientation process and can also um, you know, start eliciting some of the things that that people might want to talk about too, or at least prepping folks for for saying, you know, and make sure you talk about that when you come in. Okay, so so one thing that um, you know talk about in terms. Of, oh, I see another comment here. We do have MAs and RNs who also do an amazing job and listen to the complaints and ease patients' minds to the wait for the provider. They can also share concerns with the provider. That that's really fantastic because basically what what you're doing then is you're you're helping people spend time before they come see you to to formulate their 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 concerns and and we know that this is is really super effective. There there was a now sort of classic study it's it's probably 20 or 30 years old now it involved adults uh, who uh, had either diabetes or hypertension and it just the, the sole intervention was asking people to take a couple of minutes in the waiting room and jot down a couple of uh, questions on a piece of paper that they wanted to ask the primary care provider that they were going to go in and see and and those patients had lower hemoglobin A1Cs and blood pressures than people who who weren't asked to do that. It was a a really simple intervention, but it it changed the the nature of the of the visit because it got people in a, an interesting way more relaxed and more thinking about what it was that they wanted to provide and make when that they wanted to cover in the visit and also it gave them a, a chance to feel a little bit more in charge of the process. So <clears throat> that those those MAs and RNs who who transition and who can um, help people be thinking about what it is they want to talk about, pass that on to you, it, it's invaluable. <clears throat> so in terms of actually sort of greeting people, I, I was originally taught as as a pediatrician to be very enthusiastic and i would you know walk in and say oh that's that's your wonderful baby and you all look so wonderful and there is certainly it's it's nice to be upbeat it's nice to be complimenting folks but on the other hand it can make it very hard for people sometimes to then say well as a matter of fact i feel terrible um or as a matter of fact i've got something that i'm really worried about so any of you have any uh, advice for for uh, all of us about how to how to sort of walk in being positive, but at the same time just projecting the added idea that there's that there's space um, and both space and time. So what what do you do when you um, you know enter a room uh, with a family to um, you know show them that you are there, show them that you're listening. Anybody have any tips about that? I'm going to unmute myself. Uh, oh, this great. Is Thanks. Everson. Yeah, Hi. great. Thank you. And I, um, I'm no longer in the clinical setting, but I was for a large number of years. And I find that this initial greeting is the most it sets the tone for the entire conversation for the practitioner when they're coming in, how you engage in this family. So practicing your cultural competencies um, is, you know, is eye contact appropriate? Is being more upbeat appropriate? Do you need to use an interpreter or um, alternative language skills should you possess them? So all of that can help with that um, easing the, the family patient through the door. And as someone that worked in school nursing setting 
the fact that they're there in your office, like recognizing the hurdles, the barriers that had to be overcome mm -hmm. for them to be there. So I think that being optimistic and being inquisitive so that you can um, utilize the practitioner's time best, this is also key for you to practice that because I know a lot of practitioners are production-based now. And um, frankly, a lot of um, patient complaints are is that they're treated that way when they're in the office, that it's, it, it's, Hey, I have 15 minutes and I have this many patients to see today. And that's how the nurse treated me. And that's how the front desk treated me. And that's how the practitioner treated me. So, mm -hmm. um, taking that into consideration when engaging, I think is really important. Well, thanks so much, Mandy. That I, that's, that's so well said. I mean, do you have any tips for the rest of us on how to, how to give the impression of time um, despite the fact that you, you have these pressures, um, I, so I worked for a very large health organization and we have those metrics that we have to have in order to mm. be compliant. So weight and blood pressure and, and heart rate and respirations and mm. all of that intake stuff. And you have to be engaged with your screen when you're doing that. But once I, once I have done that as efficiently as possible, I stop I turn, I look at the family, I engage with them, I ask questions, you know, all of those nonverbal cues as well, mm -hmm. and make sure that they know that their concerns are my main focus and that I will relay yeah. that to the practitioner. No, well, that's fantastic. Thank that you could not, <laughs> you... webinar over, <laughs> you said all the really important stuff. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Kennedy says, I agree with Mandy. I'd like to enter the room with a smile, take things slow, show people you're not in a rush, that you have time to sit with them. And um, I think that the the two things that I'll just add to that are, <clears throat> one, as I said before, I think this is time that's incredibly well invested in our efficiency. So th th I think there's always that as an ulterior motive, but, but I find that some of that, just that tiny little slowing down is also a break for me. Um, that that there's something very affirming and uh, makes me remember why I'm you know, in this line of work in, in the first place. Just having that moment of connection that Mandy was was talking about, um, it it it's it's very uh, very sustaining to to me as well. Great. Well, thank you both so much for that. Um, okay. So, so then let's, let's just flip to this next, you know, question about sort of, you know, identifying, you know, people's concerns. I, you've already talked, you know, really nicely about the idea that um, this process, uh, you know, really starts at the front desk, that the, our colleagues who are, you know, helping us to room patients and to get their vital signs and to get them uh, ready for this that next part of their visit are also you know getting information and, and passing that on um, but we know that people have multiple concerns they come in they they may not know which one they want to talk about they may not have it be completely uh, formulated um, they might not even exactly know why they're why they're there. They just know that there's something they want to talk about, um, but they they're not quite sure. Um, so we need techniques for trying to sort of get everything else get get everything out on the table. And and if we are thinking from an efficiency point of view, of course, the big thing that we want to avoid are you know really big questions that come up at the end when. Um, somebody might be, you know, we, we think the visit's over and then they say, oh, and by the way, and, and that, and it's something that just can't wait. So um, anybody here have uh, favorite ways of trying to sort of get the next, the next layer of, of concerns out on the table?
I'm, I'm taking terrible advantage of the fact that that you're a very participatory group and a very wise one. And so um, you can say stuff a whole lot better than I can. So I'm just. I think everything that's on the screen is very accurate um, mm -hmm. from my experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding the overwhelming nature of the emotions that might be involved in an appointment like this. Mm -hmm. um, and that I'm a nodder. I like to nod my head a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it right now. You can't see me, but I'm nodding my <laughs> head a lot. Um, you know, again, that that affirmation and just mm -hmm. kind of reading the situation as, as best you can using those good listening skills. That sounds really hard or like teasing the information. Oh, I'm not really sure why I'm here. My, my kid's social worker or counselor or principal or whatever, what have you said that I needed to come in or a school mm -hmm. nurse, whatever the, the case may be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oh, that, that sounds like can be very overwhelming. Tell me more about that. You know, just mm -hmm. again, the time piece, it, that's that most super valuable um, uh, thing that we can't ever get back. So, um, and again, the dividends that it pays because you took an extra, you know, minute to get to kind of the base of it and prep your practitioner, then, you know, they can dive right in and utilize their expertise as best they can. Mm -hmm. Can you just, I like to ask how you feel about that. What do you think the reason for that is? Yeah. So, so letting people uh, elaborate um, that, and, and that, that bit of, of actually giving people time to allow them to to think and respond is is so important and and it usually doesn't take minutes it, it it's amazing how quickly we tend to jump in after some and I do this too after someone has finished speaking or even before they finish speaking um so e even very very brief pauses are are a huge invitation to for someone to continue or to elaborate on something um I, I, some other things that uh, you know we can keep track of are um, changes in, in people's tone of voice, uh, sort of, you know, euphemisms, um, as, especially a lot of sort of aches and pains and somatic stuff. People change their uh, body language, and um, it, it it really is is okay to to point those things out to say, oh, I, I just I noticed that you um, just sort of started speaking a little differently when um, when you started talking about that, um, you know, did you notice that too? Or, or tell, tell me more about that. Um, let me just spend a little time here thinking about screening. Um, how do you all uh, screen for either emotional and behavioral things or social determinants in the um, places where you're working? Anybody, do you use like the PSC or PHQ or you know, any of the other other things? I know on this call, there are some providers that do. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that, are, that aren't okay. on my keen, but <laughs> okay. um, yes, because when they call in, there are screeners that they're telling us that they have utilized already. Okay. Okay. So, so a couple of different things that, that are important to, when you're thinking about, about screening in terms of, again, trying to sort of get stuff on the table. So, so screening is really important for at least you know, two reasons. I mean, one is it's a um, it's a signpost. You're you're telling people that this is something that we care about. Uh, it's important that it gets given out in a way that that shows that it's important. I mean, we don't want someone to say, "Oh, you know, here's a piece of paper to fill out. Can you update your insurance? And by the way, have you thought about killing yourself recently? You know that that's not 
how we want to do screening. But if someone gives out a screener and says, you know, here's some some things that that here in our practice we really think are important, uh, you know, either the nurse or the doctor or somebody will talk to you about about these things. You know, do you feel comfortable filling it out? If you have any questions, let me know. Um, that kind of question is, is that kind of approach is is very important to saying yes. In in this practice, we we think about these uh, sorts of uh, behavioral or emotional issues, and, and and we care about them, and we're competent to do something about it. Um, this, the second thing is it does give people a chance to think, um, and they may or may not actually answer the questions in the way you think they are. We can't always sort of trust the score. Uh, and especially people may under-report things um, if they are worried that it's stigmatizing or they're not quite sure you know, the categories don't quite apply to them. Um, but it does get them thinking. And that leads us to the next thing, which is that no matter what the screen <clears throat> results say, it's important to ask about them. So um, if, if you're the person who goes over the screen after it's been filled in with somebody, regardless of what it says, you, you want to say something like, oh, I, I noticed that um, you take that off, you know, tell me a little bit more about that, or looks like everything's, um, you know, fine here, but was there anything else that as you filled this out that made you uh, want to think about? Did, do any of you, do any screening for for social determinants of health, you know, for uh, housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, other sorts of needs. Does that seem like something that will be in the in the future? The, the the main point that I wanted to make here is is that um it's a it's a huge you know indicator of context. Oh yeah, okay. Kaylee says yes, each visit. We ask those questions almost every visit. Oh, fantastic. What's what's been the, the impact of doing that? How how has that either given you a different sense of the of the context of the, in which the family is working, or maybe even giving you hints about about what the nature of the you know sort of emotional or behavioral problems are. Anybody have a good story about you know finding out something on one of those screeners that they didn't expect? <laughs> The wonderful thing about the chat is that you can pick on people. <laughs> Kaylee, do you, um, do you have a do you have any good stories about about doing that that screening? You ever did you ever find out something that you didn't wouldn't have thought, you know, for a given family, or 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 just the answer to that really changed the visit. Yeah, so if we have a positive screen on that social determinants, um, what happens often is social work will try to get in touch either through like my chart and just give some ideas of where they can find some different um, food resources or housing. Mm -hmm. I actually had a patient that chose my location of where I was at because um, the food pantry was going to be open an hour after our appointment. So that was like, oh, yeah, that's that's happening. Okay. And just being very respectful and thanking them for their honesty and um, really like just overall, like really congratulate them to get out and like seek those resources. Mm -hmm. like I've told other people. You know, there's always resources. Sometimes we just don't know where to look or who the right person to ask until we stumble upon a questionnaire or the right yeah. answer. So. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. That that's that's a really a really great story, and I I think that um, the 
the thing that is so powerful to me about about doing this kind of, of screening or I, first of all as you say you can really actually help people with very concrete things and that is in such a huge intervention in, in terms of how they feel um and how they uh how they feel about themselves and and how they are in the world but also it's 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 such a window into um into people's lives and and it's such an important part of, of figuring out training uh, how, how to help them that sometimes i think that we're afraid to <clears throat> do this screening because we can't fix all of these things we, we can't necessarily um you know find people housing sometimes we can't even find them food or 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 other needed things but it can at least help us to not um do things which are are futile and make them feel worse i mean <clears throat> i I don't know how many times I have, you know, done my routine about sleep hygiene, you know, how I'm going to help some uh, family get their kid to go to sleep by having a regular bedtime or, you know, having a light on or, or whatever. And then I find that they're unstably housed and they're all crammed into one small space or they don't actually <clears throat> sleep in the same place for more than a few nights in a row um so so having this information um it, even if you can't fix the underlying cause really allows you to to tailor your advice to folks in a way that's much more likely to be helpful okay so so then the the big question is we have all this stuff on the table and and we have this you know tiny little bit of of time in which to to try to work. So um, while people are are talking, um, and you know one mark of your success can be that people will talk and they'll talk about a lot of things because you've um, you've given them space to do it. You've shown that you are a, a compassionate listener. Um, they believe that you are a really good clinician and you have lots of things at your fingertips and so they're going to keep talking and they'll potentially give you a whole lot more uh to to work with than you can do in in your very short visit so what are some of the things that you that you can do to try to pull this pull this together and remember our, our long-term goal here over the two sessions is to get to some problem that that we can then actually help people with so the, fir the first thing is realizing that this is not taking as much time as it seems that um you know our sense of, of time pressure can can really get in the way but after a while it, it can't go on forever ever um so being aware of when you can tactfully break into somebody's story and then say well okay, um, I know we don't necessarily have all the time that we would like to have here, but can I just play back to you what I've been hearing? Um, can I can I sum it up? Um, and then is there anything else that I've, I've missed? Um, okay, if, if we've got that list, is there, what would you say is the most important thing, you know, for you today um, that you'd really like to cover? Um, and then is it okay if if I shift now to offer a plan for working on this, um, okay, if we've got those top two or three things, can I throw out some ideas about how we might sort of approach them? Um, I'm just going to go to Kennedy's comment here. Oh, going back to the social determinants, again, hint about home life, amount of stress they're under, hint to where we can refer this family patient. Yes. So so having that in your mind, especially if you've done that screening before a visit, is is, is super important. Um, so going back to this idea of, of pulling a, a bunch of concerns into some sort of a plan for what we're going to do today and what we might have to do at a next visit, any, anybody else have any, um, any suggestions on how you like to do that? How this, how you know when it's okay to break in? Uh, okay, really like motivational interviewing. <clears throat> uh huh.
Yes, and, and I, I saw in the echo list that I think you're going to have um, motivational interviewing uh, a, a webinar on this and coming up in a little bit. So so that's fantastic. And and this this is a good place for using some of those motivational interviewing you know techniques as well because so so much of that relates to having people reflect on what their priorities are. So so what is it that you really like to to do today? Um, I I can show that I understand the range of your concerns, and can can we prioritize those things together? So so what we're going to try to do next time. When for the next session is to then take that sort of actionable goal into some sort of a way of helping people find a way forward. And the the big piece here is that we don't necessarily have to have the answers ourselves. This is what this solution focused approach is is going to sort of talk about when we um, get back together next time. So we're going to ask people to, to think about, okay, this child's behavior, and this child's mood, your um, you know, stress within your relationship with your partner, um, these, these are, are, are your top issues. Um, uh, and you think and go back you know, was there a time when this um, wasn't really, you know, the, it wasn't as bad and what was going on then? Um, and is there a way that you maybe already have the answer within you to, um, to, to get to the solution you want? But what I wanted to do just to sort of wrap up is to think, about um, are there, uh, does anybody have a, um, oops, Barry's committed at this point. What does that mean? Yes. So again, th this whole idea of, of screening as a way of, of getting stuff out on the table so that you can really effectively, you know, make a, make a treatment plan and not have to just sort of discover stuff um, too late. <clears throat> I wanted to just take the last couple of minutes to ask if you were, if people could think about um, stories. Um, so one is, are there, can you, anybody have a good story about a, a situation where somebody came in and, <clears throat> this was a potentially problematic encounter where um, this is someone who has either complained in the past, somebody who uh, you can just tell that if this visit could go south very, very quickly because the you know person doesn't seem like they're in the greatest mood um, and where you did something that uh, made it made it better um where you were able to sort of turn the switch and get this person into a a place where they could think more positively does anybody have a remember in, in a patient or a family encounter like that or, or maybe a composite of ones And what, and and why that, why what you did might have worked. I'll go. Um, okay, thanks. It, it has a it has a mental health component, but I was not working in mental health at the time. Uh -huh. um, I was working in um, a derm surgical clinic setting, and right. we had a patient that had been referred to us. And um, they'd come for their initial visit and um, they just gave off that vibe. Like, I don't really want to be here. I'm kind of gruff. I'm kind of grumpy. I mm -hmm. like I'm very curt answers. Like you need to be very poignant, very direct. They weren't really going to open up. <clears throat> and so 
came in, had their initial visit, had a biopsy done, biopsy results came back and they were um, positive for skin cancer and um, they needed to have surgery to have it removed uh, per the physician's recommendation. Mm -hmm. And um, gave patients this information and, again, experienced that same um, almost, almost confrontational, mm -hmm. um, not even flat affect, but very, very mm -hmm. unhappy. And um, was trying to schedule it as, an, as the nurse. We, we scheduled the, the surgeries mm -hmm. and the patient was just not having it. And I like... I'm reading that vibe. And so I finally asked, I said, um, is there, is there something going on or how can I help you? And, you know, this is something that would, you know, time-wise that this, you know, here are kind of our parameters and our guidelines, but what, what can I, you know, how can I help you with scheduling this? And it turned out that his dog had just died. Oh, wow. And like, he's like, I cannot deal with having cancer. I need to grieve my dog. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, perfect. Well, then here's, okay, we'll push this out. We'll, we'll you know, whatever, we'll call you later. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly what I did. It was a number of yeah. years ago. But like, just that, like, mm -hmm. again, nonverbal reading the room and then like asking some of those hard questions. Um, yes. We we made a way forward and um he he grieved as he needed to and eventually did have his um procedure done and um yeah so there's my example what a wonderful story that's 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 just so amazing and 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 your um your ability to to pick up on the fact that um that there that a there was something going on and that it didn't necessarily have anything to do with the what was going on with you or with the visit, but but it was it was so super important to that person. That what a what a great story. It's fabulous. <laughs> okay, we have so we have uh, just a couple of minutes. And I wanted to, and I know that they'll want to either have a couple of minutes before you move on to your next thing to do the evaluation stuff. So, um, anybody have a sort of a similar story where where if somebody a family came in and um they there was a chief complaint but but then there was a real problem that was underneath it um that that somehow you were able to help people to identify If you don't have one, I have one. <laughs> okay, so given given the time, I'll 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 throw out one, which is just that I I saw a, a family the other day, and the the chief complaint was um, depressed son, a uh, fifteen year old, uh, really lovely kid from one of the local high schools who was um, you know irritable, losing interest in school. You know, various various sorts of things and um but in in the course of the of, of the visit what it really turned out the 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 real problem was is that the the family had had this really precipitous fall from sort of middle class to practically losing their home over the last uh you know couple of years and fortunately they had really just made this sort of miraculous catch at the bottom of the fall and uh, mom who was a single mom had uh, been able to get a, a really good good job and um, a union a union job that, that really guaranteed uh, had some job security and a reasonable uh, pay rate and um, and that was what was really going on was they're sort of adjusting to this near miss and to how they were going to now kind of go back to not living with this constant sense of uh, of, of crisis and um the <clears throat> i think the way that we got <clears throat> to the bottom of of that was 
by, um, in this particular case, really watching a lot of the mom's um, nonverbals. And I think her at some point in the, in the course of this visit, realizing that it was okay for her to talk about what was in her mind too. And not just that we weren't just there to sort of hear just what was happening with the with the young man, but but that we were open to hearing what was happening in her life as well. Um, so going back to that one of those slides about really trying to make contact with everybody in the room because you really don't know who in the room is going to be the person who, who is going to have the key to to fixing things. So I'm going to make the slides go away here. So I can say hi to everybody for a second. Thank you so much for um, being part of this and for your wonderful stories. I mean, this was a a great um, a great session. I I learned a lot, and I, I love hearing from these other folks. Thank you, um, everybody, for for sharing and being great participants. Um,